Thank you all for making it here this, this early on a Saturday morning. Um, this is not the time that I'm usually awake on a Saturday morning, so I'm feeling the way you guys are feeling, and I appreciate you coming out. Um, I got a lot of stuff I, I'm gonna, I can talk about. Um, I'm going to rip through my slides and sort of give you an overview. I'll be out at, at our booth over here if you want to catch up afterwards, um, and I can tell you anything else that you feel like hearing. Um, I am Garrett Walker. I have worked at uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch for 11 years, uh, which for some people is a, is a lifetime in our company. I'm a child still. Um, routinely we come across people to work there for 25, 30, 35 years. It's a, it's a, it's a crazy place like that. Um, but I have been doing uh, what I'm going to talk about today for eight years. Um, so I can tell you the good, I can tell you the bad, and, and answer any questions you have um, in the booth. So what are we going to talk about today? We are going to talk about the financial crisis a little bit. Got to give you a little bit of background on why we did what we did. Um, but I'm going to try and. Right now, let's get into Hood Celebrity Walking Trophy. Finance. Um, but I got to give you the background. And then I'm going to talk about what we built in response to the financial crisis, which is a Python platform that we sort of launched as a startup for today, 4,300 developers to work on that tries to make the mundane tasks trivial and tries to make the difficult tasks viable. Um, just to sort of whet your appetite, uh, in the early days uh, when public cloud wasn't an option, still not an option for me, um, we had and we wrote um, some capabilities that allows you to execute tasks out on a grid with a single line of code. Uh, you didn't know at the, at the beginning, you didn't know what grid that was going to. You didn't have to worry about managing that. You didn't have to pay for it. It was just there for you as a resource. And that's the kind of thing that allowed us to get off the ground very quickly and to get our early developers productive um, in, in, as we were building out the platform and they were trying to build apps on top of it. So I'll talk more, much more about other examples of what we've done and why Python has made it, us to, uh, able to be successful. Um, and so today, what we have is a platform called Quartz that is at the heart of global markets technology and what we're trying to do in the investment bank. Just a little bit about me. Um, I am not ever going to try and convince you I'm the best Python programmer ever, nor would I at any time in my career, but I have had a long path with Python. I started when I was a sysadmin at Rutgers uh, in college. I won't tell you what year that was, but it started with a one, not a two. Um, then I went to work for a company called Sapient. It was a great company. Um, didn't get to choose technology as much, but I sprinkled it into projects when I could. Really, I, I really mostly learned there why I didn't like Perl. Um, and I saw Perl not survive the five to six jump, which I don't think it ever came back from. Um, and so I learned a lot of lessons that we're now going to apply going from Python 2 to 3. Um, when I came to Merrill Lynch, I was able to choose my technology because uh, I started a group and I was maintaining Python there. And then uh, the Quartz project started that was all Python based and I moved internally there as the company also flipped to, to Bank of America Merrill Lynch. So I've been doing this a long time. Um, I also have an extensive path with Pythons. Um, I like to play Pokemon Go in real life. Um, so I do weird things also. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the financial crisis and what caused the financial crisis. Um, as technologists, we're often encouraged to find the root cause of a problem. And at the 10 year anniversary, so the red line is actually 10 years ago today. So it's for people that were uh, in banking 10 years ago, it was a nervous time. And what I, what I try and tell my team to do is don't look for the root cause, look for the root causes because there's almost always more than one. And in case of the financial crisis, the Motley Fool has come up with actually a list of 25, this is in 2015, and people have been really revisiting this in the last couple of days um, on the anniversary of some of these events, but um, over 25 causes of the financial crisis. But from where I sat in the investment bank, there was really only one major cause that I cared about, that I thought was the, the, the biggest impact. And that was this graph, which some people may recognize if they were working uh, at the time, and that is the implosion of Lehman Brothers. And 
Um, this really changed the world. It changed my world tremendously. The regulations and the change of the business environment that came out after this literally changed the world. Nobody thought this was going to happen because We expected this to happen, and so the ramifications of it. Go ahead, do, do whatever you got to do. The um, <laughs> the ramifications of it. Uh, that, that's part of the reason why the ramifications. Banks like mine. I worked at Merrill Lynch at the time. We weren't yet Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Uh, they have a, a, a tight coupling with each other. The banks trade a lot bilaterally, as they, as they call it. Um, and nobody understood the complexity, right, and the, and the nuance behind this interaction between the big investment banks. And, and the regulations that you see today, today are direct correlations to people not understanding the complexity of these interactions. Because it doesn't look like this. It's not two entities trading with each other. It's actually large networks of legal entities and sales entities that, that interact in difficult ways. And from a business perspective, they tend to be set up horizontally. So you have trading desks that trade with each other. And we work in technology. And when you work at a big bank, Conway's law always applies. Conway's law says that, roughly speaking, the technology you produce will reflect the shape of your organization. And that is exactly what happened at a lot of the banks. You got tech stacks that were aligned to these siloed businesses that were motivated to deliver value through those businesses. And so when we started looking at some of the enterprise functions, as we call them, like risk and finance and capital, um, and you don't necessarily need to know what those things are, but you know, there are people that look to try and aggregate across all of those silos. And we didn't have the culture that allowed us to do it. We didn't have the technology that allowed us to do it. So when Lehman Brothers went under, most of the banks, I mean, there's, there's speculation, obviously, but most of the banks, people thought it took them about a month to figure out what their actual exposure, what the impact of Lehman going under was to them. And Goldman Sachs, who had a system similar to the one that I'm talking to you about, claimed that they could do it in between a day and a week, depending on who you listen to. So having an ability to look horizontally, a culture that says up front we're going to look horizontally at our exposure and our risks, uh, became a non-option in the, in the wake of the financial crisis. The last thing I'll sort of mention in this space, again, if you work for a big organization, data feeds become an anchor on your organization. Every data feed requires reconciliations. It requires operational people to make sure it runs correctly. There's a lot of operational risk. And the network of data feeds that we had were quite extensive at the time. And so that was another motivation. So what did we do? Well, we launched a startup of, of, of sorts. We brought in uh, a group of people that we expanded uh, fairly quickly into a wedge that we drove into the middle of this problem. Uh, this is not how everybody goes about solving this, and this is certainly not the only way to solve this problem, but we took a big bang approach. And the idea was to give us a, as I said, a wedge that would allow us to solve some of the near-term problems while we unwound the, the years that built up the picture on the left. And that has largely worked. So let me talk just a little bit more detail about, about what Quartz is, and we'll get into some of the Python-specific stuff. So Quartz is a Python platform as a service. Um, at the bottom, it is built up of a set of integrated technology components. Uh, I talked about the, the private cloud that we have and that we make available to our developers. Uh, we wrote an object database to store Python objects. Um, we also interact extensively with relational databases and other storage technologies. Uh, we have sort of, you know, this is our lights on capabilities layer. What, what do you need as a developer? We probably have it. Web services, we can write that. Um, job scheduling, yes, it comes out of the box. Um, tons of third party open source libraries. Um, to do everything from routine tasks like FTPing, uh, which we try and minimize, to uh, data science and uh, sort of the, the, the NumPy, SciPy suite. Um, on top of that, we've built an entire development environment. Again, it all comes out of the box. So you get an IDE. It's integrated to our SDLC. You don't need to stand up repositories. You don't need to do anything except start committing code. 
um, literally on, on, on day one, modulo entitlements, uh, getting access. Um, this is really where the platform as a service comes in. Um, we had, in the beginning, a hyper agile release cycle where you would make a change, peer review it, and immediately push it to production. It's a zero build environment, so as soon as you push it to production, everybody else in the ecosystem can see that change. Um, allowed us to move very, very quickly in the beginning. We've dialed that back a little bit as it's become more of a critical platform to the organization, but, but very agile at its heart. And then on top of that, we built a business layer to actually solve the business problems that I talked about before. Um, and we uh, un used it as a platform to unify data sets within the organization. We have a ton of data in the investment bank. We use it as a data unification platform. And then we run major enterprise programs on top of it. Our major regulatory programs all run on top of courts. Major business initiatives run on top of courts. As I said before, it's, it's at the heart of what we do. Um, Okay, how much Python do we have? It's actually 82 million lines of Python code right now under management. We have 4,300 Python developers working every year, um, and they commit on average a million code commits a year. Um, not really the greatest stat, to be honest with you. You don't want to be up here bragging about you have a, a ton of code, uh, but it, it does speak to the scale at which we have to operate. Um, and to some degree, it represents the maximum and our goal now is to compress it. So the title of this talk is 17 million lines of code, um, and that's more where we want to now get down to. So we brought everything in, and we're going to scale it back down. And the 17 million also more represents the, the, the business critical set of, of code that we have. But in either dimension, it's, it's an awful lot. Um, our internal cloud, our private cloud, is up to about 350,000 cores and our, uh, our homegrown database stores about 8.2 petabytes of, of data right now. So, okay, let's get to why you guys are here and talking about why we chose Python. So, when we started, um, you know, we were trying to plan a platform for the next 15 to 20 years. That was about the time horizon that we were looking at. And choosing a language is actually very difficult for that time horizon. Um, many of you may work in languages that have gone in and out of fashion. Uh, I, in my experience with Perl, where Perl sort of died halfway through my technical career, and I had to pivot to another language. Um, you know, educational opportunities, these things all come into mind when you're trying to, to build something that is as strategic as Quartz is. And so this actually isn't a trivial question that we were asking ourselves. We spent a lot of time thinking about what, you know, what the right language is. And obviously we landed on Python. This is probably going to be a little preaching to the choir since you guys are here at a Python conference. But um, last month, Python went number three on the Toby index of, of programming language popularity. Uh, that has been a trend it's been on since we made this decision. So we, we made a good bet on, on Python being popular and staying popular. Um, obviously, you know, dynamically typed interpreter language, I think, lowers the bar for, for getting up to speed on it. So we will hire people with Java backgrounds, with C++ backgrounds. It's a pretty easy conversion over to Python. Um, in the time that we made this decision, we've seen school curricula really come around, uh, which some of you are either living right now or, or experiencing in your uh, corporate lives as well, uh, which makes it really helpful for us to get that pipeline of talent. Uh, you know, 4,300 people call 15% turnover every year. We need a healthy pipeline of talent. Um, also, the I wouldn't call it a resurgence, the, the, the embracing of Python by the data science community and the science community at large also brings good intersection with people that are physics majors, engineers, et cetera, who have now a flavor of Python coming out of, of their advanced degrees. And of course, online, you can learn a ton. What has uh, really been a challenge for us? Uh, I'll just mention some of the things. I'm not trying to start a religious war with anyone. Um, we have seen some challenges, and some of them are actually marketing challenges, but some of them are actual performance challenges around the interpreted language. We do an awful lot, actually, in C++ under the covers, which I'll t I can talk a little bit about. Um, and we heavily rely on our grids and our GPU-based grids to do the real number crunching. So for, uh, we get a lot of people coming out of school who are saying, you know, well, 
you know, I want to use multi-threading. Python's not a great multi-threading language. And our answer is, yeah, that's kind of right, so don't use multi-threading. Uh, use a grid-based uh, distributed model instead. So there's some, some challenges there that have required some sort of education for our people. Um, the thing that has made life very difficult for us uh, as an infrastructure group that's trying to build sort of the base classes for other people to build on top of is the lack of language level code protection. Uh, we have some pattern that we're trying to, to, to roll out through the object-oriented model and people can subvert it and the language doesn't help us. Uh, everything's through convention in Python with underbars and stuff like that. And it's just really difficult when you have this much code to enforce conventions when the language doesn't help you. Um, dynamic typing, uh, you know, a very love-hate relationship with dynamic typing, which maybe some of you guys have come across. Um, you know, it works very well, uh, except that you know the way that we have designed our software, our 82 million lines of code are, are have the potential to be interconnected, which means that we don't have a compiler on our side to help test out uh, very subtle bugs related to um, to the dynamic typing. So it requires a lot more testing than it might might otherwise, and this is really going to, I think, show itself when we go to migrate from Python 2 to Python 3. I put Python 2 to Python 3 up here because they did change an awful lot in the language. I, I agree with pretty much everything they've done. Totally cool with it, but it does represent for people like us and a lot of people in this room a significant challenge in terms of continuing to stay on Python. So it's up there. Um, that was already, by the way, on the radar when we made the decision, so we went in you know, knowing what we were getting ourselves into. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, you know, a fair amount about the challenges we have there. But the answer is that Python really fits our, our, our problem space. Rapid development in Python has worked extremely well for us. The ability to prototype something in Python and then later rewrite it in C++ when, we, when it works and the APIs are solid has been extremely good for us. Access to the language internals has been great. I'm going to talk about how we hacked into Python to build more functional capabilities. It worked great. Um, we, we were able to persist raw Python objects, um, which has solved a lot of the business problems that we have. Um, we are able to design architectures basically pipelined all in C++ without having to pop up to Python, uh, which makes things go very, very fast when we need to. And the community of which you are a part is outstanding around Python, and we've really benefited from that. <coughs> the last thing I'll talk about, again, not trying to get into religious wars here, but XKCD, it's like, it's like, it's like they work at my company. Um, every time, we were just talking about data pipelines, and like a week ago, he put out a data pipeline comic in it. The guy's great. Um, but this is reality, right? And when you have 4,300 developers, they can't land day one and try and figure this picture out for themselves in their special way. So we have made a decision to optimize this picture in a way that not everybody likes, but that works and scales. And um, you know, I, I love Python, but my home development environment looks like this too. And and we just we can't have that to scale the platform. So. Um, Bit of a challenge and bit of a trade-off that you'll find when you're doing large-scale Python. You have to start making some of these decisions and you will not make everybody happy. Okay, so let me try and get into some of the Python-specific stuff that we've done. Um, when you're doing uh, calculations in finance in particular, you end up with uh, models that have graphs of functions and you want to make those go as fast as possible. Um, I think the example here is Fibonacci, where you're trying to drill down into the leaf nodes and then the calculations are going to go back up. Uh, but each of these blocks needs to be reused on the way back up. Uh, this is a recursive implementation. Um, and so you can get substantial speed up if you're using memoization within the language. And we've built um, a blend of memoization and functional programming into a directed acyclic graph implementation. And we did that by uh, building it into Python itself. So we actually, at, at parse time, we rewrite your code based on what we call the DAG, the graph. Um, and we use that to, to build a tree uh, of functional function calls. And then we use memoization and other features to make those calculations efficient. Why do you want to do this? Well, 
imagine that you have this sort of complicated graph of calculations and you want to test the impact of certain changes to inputs of some of those calculations. You can change those impacts, we call this what if scenario. Uh, running what if scenarios, you can change some of those inputs and it only rebuilds the parts of the graph that have changed based on where those inputs come into the graph. Uh, and that's why it needs to be uh, acyclic. Um, this works very, very well for us and only languages, well, not only languages, you can, you, can, you can do it in other programming languages, but Python makes it very easy to extend in this way. Um, the other thing is that this graph structure, because we wrote a Python object store, we can directly integrate persisting these kinds of objects. So in a single line of code, you just create some, some object and then you call write on it. Uh, you do actually need to know where that's going to go, but uh, that will then persist it into our database. Again, you don't think about it for the most part. Um, and you can rehydrate that object at any time and you'll get the same behavior with the same data, depending on kind of how you design things. But it, it allows, it maps very well to our storage paradigm. Talking a little bit more about that storage paradigm, when you write your Python, we are as Python first, as Python centric as you can get. So as you're writing your Python objects, you can um, indicate which of them should be persisted into the database versus ones that you want to recalculate when the, those objects are rehydrated. Uh, for us, I've used the movie ticket paradigm here where if, you know, maybe you want to uh, adjust the price of your movie tickets based on the popularity of the movie um, and you want to make sure that your cinemas are all charging the same price. It's a bit of a trivial example, but this is reality for us. When you're looking at the pricing of financial instruments, no matter who looks at that, they need to get the same answer. And so you persist the inputs, you are effectively persisting the code that calculates the outputs at the same time, and you guarantee that everybody gets the same answer, and that's critical for us, being able to prove uh, data lineage and pricing lineage, basically. Um, we have a job scheduler that we, that we wrote. Um, just thought I'd point out that, that not everything we do is Python, so we're here, we're using YAML for job definitions, so we try and take advantage of, of other technologies um, like YAML and, and to a lesser extent JSON um, that, that, are, um, that have a good niche within the, the ecosystem. Um, nothing fancy here, it's totally contrived, um, but it just shows that we have a capability, we, you know, a lot of our life in the bank is, is batch oriented, and so we have a strong batch scheduling system to, to run that. You can also do dynamic jobs, trees of jobs. Um, we also do plenty of stuff in real time, but this I thought I'd just put up to show another example of what, what we wrote. Um, on the stat slide, we run about 88,000 scheduled jobs per night. Okay, so I want to talk about Python 3 because you know, I was talking to some folks yesterday and I think a lot of people, it seems late in the game, but I think a lot of people are st still trying to figure out when to go to Python 3. Some of you may be lucky enough to not have had this problem, but if you look on the bottom, it's a little hard to read, but, but th that's sort of the journey of Python, right? So. Python 3 on the left, you know, yes, it came out fairly, uh, fairly early on on this chart uh, in 09 at the end of 08, uh, but it took a long time for third party libraries to, to, um, to come around. I went to PyCon just a, a couple of years ago actually in um, Montreal and Guido was still basically, his keynote was still begging people to find a library and migrate it uh, because, because third party library support is so important to getting this migration to be successful. So we're definitely on the tail end. But if you look at the chart at the top, which is our commits per month, peaking out at about 100,000 commits per month, I mean, there's no great time in there from an activity perspective to say, okay, now's the right time. Let's take a slowdown on what we're trying to do from a business perspective and migrate this code to Python 3. So if you're, you know, if you're really committed to Python, you're not gonna find an obvious time where converting a lot of code is gonna be the good, the, a good idea, a good time. So at some point, you're gonna have to bite the bullet, right? And you're gonna have to make a business decision to, to do this, this upgrade. Um, again, if you look at our uh, lines of code over time, 
you know, it's a parabola. There's no like obvious, oh, here was a pause and where, you know, things slowed down. So let's go ahead and, and do our upgrade then. So today, uh, just being honest, you know, what's driving our upgrade is the Python 2.7 end of life. Um, I think it's good that the Python community came out and said, that's it, it's over. And I hope they stick to that date. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it's the right approach. But at the same time, um, you know, you've got to pick your, your time. So just getting to the end of it, uh, and I'm going to leave it here. This is our approach. You guys can take uh, what approach works for you. But the good thing about waiting is that there's a lot of tooling in the community that now will come back around to help you out. The six module, the future module, and the monetize module. So the six and future for compatibility and monetize for automation uh, are really strong right now. And we're tailoring those to our needs so that we can move to a hybrid model where both 2.7 and, and 3.7 in our case are gonna run simultaneously. And then we'll look at getting to pure Python 3 probably in 2020. And that's where I'm gonna leave it. Thank you guys very much, I appreciate it. I'll be in the booth if anybody has questions. I can't take questions, they're gonna kick me out. So come see us over there. I'll be there all afternoon. Thank you.